Funny Magicians, how are you doing today? Welcome, welcome. We are on episode 32 of the Money Ma uh, Magicians podcast, on the Money Magic podcast, right? So today my guest, my guest is Casey Blake. And if you've just joined us, my name is Vangile Makwakwa and I am the host for the podcast. I help women of color heal ancestral money trauma so that they can fall in love with their bank accounts, increase income and live their best lives. And of course, my work is not just exclusive to women of color. I'm open to other people as well. It's just that this is the market that I focus on a lot when it comes to trauma. And case in point, Casey is one of the Money Magic students. She was one of the earliest, earliest Money Magic students and I was like I have to interview her so Casey welcome thank you for saying yes to this podcast thank you for asking that <laughs> so Casey who are you what do you do tell us your hobbies your <laughs> give us a bit of background and then what you do professionally for a living cool so I am Casey Blake um, I am currently my hobbies are turning my compost heap um, it sounds really weird, but I separate the not yet compost into okay compost. Um, and that is extremely grounding. Um, and then I spread my compost around my garden and I'm trying to grow veggies, but we currently have competition in the garden between the lizards and the rodents as to who gets to eat my green peppers. Um, I'm losing and I'm very sad, <laughs> but we're gonna try new tricks this round. Um, <laughs> I have a dog child who will probably show up in the interview throughout. He's a little dog. Well, he's a 40 kilogram Doberman. Um, and uh, he's a rescue. So lots of love and attention has gone into creating our relationship. Um, and I mountain bike for fun. And for, the, I was telling Van before we started, it makes me feel like I can fly. I've got uh, structural knee issues. So I can't run and walk like regular people. But I can mountain bike and I can feel like I'm flying and I'm free. Um, and uh, when COVID is over, I'm hoping to get back to uh, aerial fitness, specifically mm -hmm. on a pole. Yeah, and what do you do for a living, Casey? <laughs> Asking. So for a living, I am a registered counselor and a sex educator. So mm -hmm. as part of my private practice for my registered counselor, as a registered counselor, I have a special interest in sexuality, trauma, gender, parenting, and relationships. I don't see couples at the moment, I'm at capacity, um, but people's relationships with themselves, with their own parents, with people in their world, it's quite an interest of mine. Mm. And I run sex education for parents um, because mm. parents are the missing link in our sex education void, um, sexuality education. So I help parents talk to their children about bodies and body functions and puberty and feeling uncomfortable around people and learning how to follow your gut. And then we to help them build up those foundational language with their children so they can actually talk about sex in a meaningful way. With oh their my children. goodness. So I posted something of yours on social media and one of my friends, this was before you were online, uh, one of my friends from um, uh, Boston, we went, we did the MBA program together, was asking, do you offer this to parents abroad? Or is it just limited to South Africans? Let me ask for her now and for everyone else so that people don't jump in my <laughs> Facebook because she was so fascinated and she wanted to do this with her children. So yes, um, it is open to everybody. So there's two ways. There, I've turned the content of the course into a 50 lesson online course that you can do at your own pace. There's about six hours of content in the actual course. Um, yeah. And so that's if you, you know, want to do it at your own pace and you just want the content. If you want me for nine hours, I run interactive workshops on Zoom based on the content that I've created over the years. I've been running these workshops for seven years now. So they have grown exponentially, as you can imagine, just like your course has. There was only 10 lessons when I joined. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. And just, um, I know we're going to be talking about trauma and everything, but because people have asked me in my inbox, so I'm just 
doing a frequently asked questions here so I can just send them to the podcast like minimizing answers whenever I share any of your stuff so um can you just talk a little bit about like what are some of the things that are covered in these workshops and why they're so important around sex education why parents need to know how to talk about sex with their children because well, I think I've shared in the student group how like my mom taught me about sex and how scarred I am from those conversations because it was like, you're going to fall pregnant. If you have sex, you're going to fall pregnant and you're, you're going to catch an STI, you know, so this is it, your drama. If you decide to even look at a man or start kissing a man, the next, the very next step is going to be sex. That's how I was taught about sex from my mother. I was just like, <gasps> I can't kiss a boy. Like it took me, I was 18 when I first had my first kiss because I was just like, oh my God, it's a slippery slope down to teenage pregnancy. Mean, <laughs> like I would like be with guys and I'd be like, we can only hug because kissing <laughs> is the next step to sex. <laughs> we talk about kissing as if it's the gateway drive to sex. And but I mean, that's the thing, that's how parents teach us, right? It's like, forget kissing. In Black communities, it's like looking at a boy and talking to a boy, right? In our household, that is the gate. Like, you're already a step to teen pregnancy, right? Just like holding hands with a boy, it, it's over for you. <laughs> so you've touched on so many important elements of why, excuse me, the workshops are over three days. And it's yeah. nine hours and we still don't finish the workbooks. So yeah. that's why there's a workbook, 40 pages per workshop. Because um, yeah. there's so much information that I want to get across. But what's more important in the workshops is for us to, yeah. as the people and the adults to talk yeah. about the way we were traumatized by mm. the messaging around sex, yeah. by the ways our parents tried to teach us about sex, but which were often incorrect and incomplete, which left us terrified do you, I can't tell you how many people I've spoken to who growing up, as soon as they started their periods, they would be told, if you sleep with a boy, you're going to fall pregnant. But what do we do at family gatherings? We all sleep in the same room. Yes. And nobody tells us there's multiple meanings for sleep. So these young people, and I only talk to people who are adults. So this is like recounting and trying to figure out their own traumas. Yes. Wait, hold on. I spent five years waking up Christmas morning and for like boxing day, all those days, trying to figure out how I was like, how do I know if I'm pregnant? Because there were boys in the room I was sleeping in. No. Children take us literally. You just told me how you took it literally. I said it literally because my mom was like, you're going to have sex. So she explained the sexual act. And as a nurse, she even brought out books, right? Like no consent on my part if I was ready to hear about this. She brought out books and then she was like, this is what happens. This is what happened now that you're menstruating. This is the thing. So it was very cut and dry and very scientific. Bless her heart. I don't know what she was trying to achieve. The parents do their like, best. Parents right? And I was just told like, yeah, you will fall pregnant during ovulation. But then my mom had the big butt people do, there is still a risk of pregnancy, even when you're not ovulating. So I don't want you to rely on that. Just know that it is the natural step. Once a man, uh, once boys start kissing you, you're going to feel all sorts of chemicals. And those are the exact words she uses, as she used. And I still remember that. You're a teenager, you're going to feel all sorts of chemicals, and you won't be able to control yourself as a teenager. And you're naturally going to say yes to sex and boom, baby. So what do I do to never have to be in that situation to ever lose control? I'm like, not even, I'm like, I'm, I'm not even going to kiss a guy. I made the biggest deal. I left high school never having been kissed, right? Because I made such a big deal of it. All my friends were getting kissed and we're having like all sorts of wonderful experiences. And it's only when I got to varsity where I was like, okay, let me start experimenting with this because I was like, and it's funny because kids are different. My sister heard all that and she was like, I hear you. And now I'm going to go and explore everything that you have told us not to do. And that's literally what she heard from my mom. And I heard, like, she was like, I'm going to rebel against it. And I'm just like, oh my God, this is horrible. I will not be able to control myself. So there was also that trauma of 
you cannot trust your own body in these moments, in these sexual instances. That is so traumatic because it's like, you are in this body, but you will, you're being taught that you will not have control over what goes on with this body. Right? I mean, you're touching on so many important things. So in the, the online course, you can, we only get sex in chapter eight. It's a nine chapter course. We mm. only talk about talking about sex in chapter eight. Wow. The reason being, we can't start with sex and make, expect it to make sense. <laughs> we have to start with personhood. We have to start with the fact that people embody bodies, that their bodies do things, that their bodies tell them emotional cues, safety cues, mm. like whether you want to do something or not, whether you're interested in something or not. We've got to start with that. Our bodies mm. tell us when we are around people who we think are unsafe before we even know that they're unsafe. Oh, Casey, why did I not know about this? I did not know that you taught this because obviously it's like for parents when you advertise this, but I'm just thinking, heck, even as a single person, this course is gonna be beneficial for me even without kids. And yeah. I'm definitely serious about this. Like, forget kids, they still gonna come in my world, right? So I'm a few years from having these discussions, but maybe for just myself and my inner child and just unpacking that because I've had to do so much work and I've shared in the student group often like how this stuff will come up in meditations and I'm just like, how in health name is this even tied to money? And yet it is because in that sexual education as I was being taught sexual education and of course how school also does it, all that I heard was you're gonna fall pregnant and you cannot trust your body you cannot trust yourself, right? Because you're a teenager and teenagers have various mood swings and you're gonna just get so turned on and then it's over from there. So I, the messaging that I learned wasn't how do you talk about sex, but rather that you cannot trust your body and you cannot advocate for yourself because your emotions and your hormones will overtake you. So the entire workshop too is how do we trust our bodies? How do we help our bodies feel pleasure from ourselves, from our worlds, from our food, from our activities? How do we know when something doesn't feel okay? Mm. How do we compare it to something that does feel okay? How do we know about boundaries? How do we tell people that Uncle Joe sits too close to me and he makes my whole body stand on edge? Wow. Because the missing link despite the curriculum is consent. But we got to talk about consent outside of sex. We got to talk about consent in terms of, please don't play those games with me. I don't enjoy them. Please don't sit so close to me. But if you sit on that chair, I can happily engage with you. Consent is, I really want to be your friend, but I don't want to hold hands all the time. Mm -hmm. so consent is hearing no and learning how to navigate rejection. Mm -hmm. Consent is learning how to reject people nicely. And not nicely for them, but because they're going to push against it, but nicely for you. How do you respect yourself and say yes to you when you say no to others? Mm. All of this outside of the context of sex, because five-year-olds, this is the content for five-year-olds. It's the content four-year-olds need. It's the content 14-year-olds, 24-year-olds. It's the content I need as an adult. Can I just say, because like I said, it's like we are trying to learn this we're trying to teach kids this when we ourselves don't know how to do it. And we ourselves don't understand it. And this is why we will beat kids when a kid says, I don't want to hug auntie so-and-so. I don't want to touch uncle so-and-so. I don't want to have him kiss my cheek and all that. And then um, when I was pushing back, when my uncle would um, kiss me and want to hug me, and eventually it became a big family drama in my family where I was like, okay, since nobody wants to listen to me and I'm 12 years old, let's put it this way. You adults no longer talk to me. And it was unheard of in my family. And I was like that up until my twenties. I was like, you have no right to talk to me because you don't, no one here is understanding the word no, and that I don't want to be touched. I don't want people kissing me. I don't want any of that. This is my body. And in a black family, they would say, which is like the rudest. It's like another word to say, you are so rude. And so I was known as this rude, rude child 
because like I had people that I was like, I am comfortable with you holding me, hugging me, touching me, not a problem. But these people, I don't like it. Something feels off for me. And it's just a plain out no, right? And I would get beaten up for that. And even when I was getting beaten up, I actually had to go to the police station to report that I was getting beaten up at home for setting these boundaries. It was a big, big thing. And I know that in my mom's family, they had never experienced a child that was advocating for themselves like that. Mm-hmm. I literally stopped speaking to family members in my teens because of that. I turned 12 and I was like, no more. And people were asking me at school, oh, do they touch you inappropriately? I was like, no, but I don't even want to find out if it will ever get there. This feels inappropriate to me. This feels like I'm saying no, and nobody's listening to the no. And I remember my teachers being like, well, if you're not being touched inappropriately, how is this a uh, crossing of boundaries. We've come so far in the last few years in understanding boundaries and physical space. And I remember saying this. So I was like 12. I don't even know where I found these words. I was like, it's about agency, right? Like I was like, I, it is my body. So I get to say what happens with it. So I understand this. And I know that the adults now looking back, I'm like, oh my gosh, all the adults around me and the only adult funny enough that backed me up was my maternal grandmother, right? She just understood what the heck I was saying, but everybody else just didn't understand it. And I just cannot even fathom, even my own mother didn't understand what I was trying to say, right? And it was my grandmother that was like, leave this child alone. She doesn't want to, you know? And she would come to me and say to me, if anyone does touch you inappropriately, you know you can always come to me. Because she couldn't understand why I was like adamant, do not touch me, do not kiss me, while I was like that with some family members. How and do I just, we expect our children to be able to say no to the outside world if they can't say no to their inside world? Exactly. Exactly. So how do you do that? Ooh, wow. This is such an important so conversation. I mean, we've just been talking workshop too. So you can get all the content on the online course. Please do. Um, I welcome you. I'm gonna, I want the link for myself. <laughs> I'm serious, Casey. Like, but in the workshops, we oh. get into this kind of detail because we talk about the workshops are age specific for the age at which the parents have kids. Yes. Even though the content, the content does change per age group. But it's yeah. so helpful to hear other parents of seven-year-olds navigating similar things to your seven-year-old, yes. right? But the workshops, we go into details about these things. We talk about the traumas of the adults mm-hmm. and how that has impacted the fact that some people don't feel comfortable hugging their own children because growing up for them had felt sexual. Yeah. And we're able to separate sexual pleasure or sexual contact because it's yeah. not always pleasurable, especially if it's, in unwanted and wanted contact, pleasurable stuff. Mm-hmm. The fact that, you know, holding hands can be pleasurable. A mm-hmm. hug is very pleasurable if it is wanted. Yeah. But it doesn't have to be sexual. When I hug my brother, it is not sexual. When I hug my sister, it is not sexual. Exactly. When I hug my friends, it is not sexual, but it's yeah. pleasurable. Yes, yes, yes. So being able to separate the idea of pleasure and sex, we have to and separate that. a society that doesn't that doesn't know how to do that. So even when you're with friends, we live in a society that doesn't know how to separate sexual pleasure from just normal pleasure and just sexual intimacy from friendship intimacy and parenting intimacy. And I do believe that like that causes a lot of tension in parenting. And just a lot of tension, even within siblings and just tension in general. Absolutely. Um, and then to, So that's why the workshops are about my pride and joy. Because yeah. in those nine hours over three days, we unpack very briefly, because there's five of us plus me, so six of us in the room. Um, so we can't go into too much depth. But just hearing that other people have had similar traumas or different traumas to you around yeah. body names, around having bodies, around contact, around touch. And then by the time we get to the third workshop where we talk about sex, everyone has like calmed down so much more. And then we can talk about the traumatizing messages around sex, how mm-hmm. to not perpetuate that. How do we talk about sex outside of the, you're gonna fall pregnant or get STIs and die? Mm-hmm. Because they're not 
they're not the same thing. <laughs> Death is here and yeah. consequences good and bad are here. And we have to be able to talk about what sex is, why people would have sex and how to protect themselves if they want to have sex. What are the risks so that they know how to navigate the risks. And how to set boundaries. Because I think that the big thing, especially with women, is how do you set boundaries in an intimate space? It's something like, I literally had to go through that. And I think I'm very lucky. I started Tantra work in my 20s, right? Most people only learn about Tantra in their 40s or mm -hmm. later on, are they exploring it because of sex and all that. But I started to realize, I was like, something happens when I am in intimate spaces and like, it feels like I'm losing my voice. So what happens when I'm someone that is so vocal and can advocate for myself so much, like I said, from a very young age. So why is it that I'm behaving differently when it's um, situations of intimacy and sexual intercourse? Why is it so hard for me to set my boundaries? And I think just like, by the time I was like on my second or third sexual partner, I was already like working through things in Tantra and learning how to set boundaries, learning how to work with uh, within intimate spaces and all that. It has helped tremendously, right? It's because, and I realized that all that freaking trauma was just like causing me to freeze up because to me, it wasn't just that I'm in an intimate space and I'm in a space where sex may or may not occur. Cause that was the other thing I used to assume that now that you're naked, every naked instance and sex and intimate a, um, incident has to lead to actual sexual intercourse. And like once I started Tantra, I realized that no, it never does, right? It can turn into anything and I can even stop it. Like at any point, I don't feel obligated to anyone in any way, but I had to find that, that actually I am not powerless when it comes to sexual incidences. I'm not powerless in uh, intimate space have a voice and I can advocate for myself and I can work with my body in any way that I want. Phew, that was a learning curve because again of how sexual education is done. This is like one of my, just one of my many pet peeves about the schooling system. And it's just like, how of the bring schooling up system. I think that society provides sexual trauma. You do not yeah. have to have had an, an incidence or violation for you to be traumatized by sex, by the way that society mm -hmm. navigates it, especially the way there are such gendered messages. So mm -hmm. men who are violated are never believed because how can men be violated? Yes. Whew. Wow. So there's so, so many layers. That it's not, it's like, it's the mixed messages. It's how we're educated around sex. And it took me a while to realize that my freeze response in terms of setting boundaries and feeling safe in intimate spaces, etc. Because I was like, I don't have like deeply scarring things from this lifetime. So I was like, what is going on? And then I realized the way I received those messages was deeply traumatizing to me. And so I was literally <laughs> traumatized in these intimate spaces. And just but yeah, man, the your, family, that. your family silenced you when you tried to put down a boundary. Thank you. I had to so go to extremes to put down that's a boundary around family. my body. Family is the beginning of intimate space. This is our mm. first intimate space. Yeah, I mean, we we come from traumatized families. Um, very few families have had access to healing. Um, because the amount of South African families, especially, but I think internationally, there's so much intergenerational trauma. But when you try to create a boundary that was really small, yeah. actually, of please ask to touch me and listen when I say no, mm. they silenced you and they pushed you. So it is not surprising to me that when you were in a sexually intimate space and you wanted to talk about boundaries, excuse me, you were silenced. You could not speak. Yes. 
Oh, my goodness. Wow. I was so scared. Also, what I remember very clearly was how I was so scared that if I ever set my boundaries in an intimate space, I would lose love from a partner because that is how I had experienced it. That like when I set boundaries, I would have to cut the person off to set my boundaries for my boundaries to be honored. And so that's how I would behave. It's like, we can't have a conversation about what's going on here. So I have to break up with you or we just never talk. I just ignore you and I block you because that was the extreme of it. Oh, my fear is that I set the boundary and then I clam up and I freak out that you're going to react in a violent manner as my partner, because that is how I had experienced people reacting to me, setting boundaries around my own body. To add to that, we are also socialized as people in feminine bodies and woman bodies that you have to be polite to get out of danger. You have to smile yes. and wave. So yes. you don't make men angry and aggressive. So there's Ooh, also that wow. messaging on top of your personal experiences of being silenced. Mm, mm, mm. This is so incredible. This is so, so powerful. I'm so glad that we're having this conversation because my goodness, how powerful is this, guys? So my, I'm so happy Casey that you went down this path with me let's bring it back to money <laughs> just for a few seconds although guys I'm pretty sure that you have learned so much from this right as much as I have so Casey what would how would you describe money to an alien I've been thinking about this question and I'm still struggling to answer it but I think I think for me at the moment, money is part of access. So mm -hmm. I would explain to an alien that money gets you into places or out of places. Mm -hmm. um, it gets you access to, yeah, access. Um, if we look at everything in our current society, the places with most more access are the places with more money. Yes. That's so true. Very, very well said. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, money buys you, like you said, access to everything. If you don't have money, you're basically not able to access a lot of what society has to offer. And you mm -hmm. have to, I, I mean, linking in with our conversation, there's something about how money provides a level of agency. Yes, yes. Um, Definitely. And I learned that at a very, very young age, right? Because I'd be like freaking out as a child. And I understood that part of why, like some of the members in my family were annoyed was because my uncle was perceived to have money. And I was supposed to be like, oh, well, if you play nice, then he'll keep supporting you and your sister and everyone. I was like, no, mm -mm. I am not part of this discussion. Like this is my body. So I think that is something so powerful. It's also, and even when you look at uh, power dynamics um, in anything, in relationships, it's often like people who have money have, tend to have more power in the relationship, right? So, I mean, obviously sometimes it's balanced by, as Caroline Mai says, uh, if someone has the higher, someone with the, uh, it also depends on sex drives. It also depends on beauty. There's also a whole bunch of things. But more often than not, it does come back to money. And money, power, money does give an amount of power and access in relationships. I'm even just thinking when I spoke about access and agency in terms of healthcare. Yes. If you have money, you have the agency to choose a, who you go to and who you see. Yeah. If you don't have access to money, you have to wait in queues for hours and hours and hours. Mm -hmm. And if you get the abusive nurse, you've got no recourse. You've got no recourse. This is so true. Whew, um, this is such a powerful way to look at money. I think this is the first time in the show that we've spoken about money as excess and like really tying it into social political issues, which I'm so glad that you are getting us there, Casey. This is so, so important. 
Um, so when did you start suspecting that your money story wasn't about the money and there was more to this than just budgeting? Honestly, when I met you, um, <laughs> there was an event with you and Joe and Lebo in like yeah. January 2017. Yes, I remember that event. It was at Leafy Greens. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And and some people at my table were very disappointed with their cauliflower chicken. Um, because they had crumbed cauliflower like chicken bits. And <laughs> for some reason they expected real chicken at a vegan restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> but I think listening to listening to you speak that day, things just made a whole lot of sense. Yeah. Um which is probably why I bought your course and became your student because it's not just about the money. Yeah. Um, yeah. The money is there, but it's yeah. not just about the budgeting. Yeah, yeah. And what do you wish you had known before you started your money journey? What do you wish people had taught you and told you? I feel like waiting for money to come in is like watching a kettle boil. <laughs> Um, it's extremely painstakingly slow mm. um, and it's so it's a frustrating process and it's a very big kettle so it's gonna it's gonna take a while yeah. um, where on the journey with money um, and thinking about money as as an energetic entity of sorts mm. just creating space for money to come in um, I mean, obviously it's not magic, but there is a magical element to the less I worry about it and maintain myself, the less I worry because money's there. Um, yes. Obviously I'm putting the work in, but I'm also trying to embrace ease and the idea that the more I rest, and it's honestly true, the more I rest and incorporate rest into my schedule, the time allocated for working has been full for ages now. Yes, yes. Wow, I love that. It is very, very counterintuitive. And I know that whenever I talk about rest and all that, like there's probably people who roll their eyes because especially I think in Joburg, more than most cities, <laughs> maybe like this is a city where you hustle, 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 right? And the belief is that if you don't hustle, you're not going to make that money, right? And people talk about hashtag 5am club. And it's like, can we please just talk about the importance of sleep and rest in the body? Because that is what's going to change the game, you know? And also, I mean, for me, it makes practical sense. If I'm sleeping, four or five hours a day, which I sometimes do and I get caught up in the drama and things. I am not as productive as when I wake up from an eight hour full sleep or nine hours of sleep and I'm just like, hey, let me get work done. I'm able to focus. I'm not fighting my body to stay awake. So instead of spending five hours fighting my body to stay awake so I can do one task, I just wake up and I do one task and I'm done with it. And that for me is so, this, this is why I feel like rest is important, but it's also very, very practical. So, I mean, I joined uh, a gift I bought myself in 20, at the end of 2018 was a, a flexibility course run by a San Diego uh, circus physio. She works on, oh. on home artists only predominantly. Uh, she's now in Canada. Yeah. Um, and she incorporates rest into the program, but she changed it from rest to recovery because when you call it rest, people don't do it. Oh, wow. This so is I'm interested. Hashtag, I mean, uh, hashtag for real. Hashtag physio on Instagram. She's amazing. Um, Jen Crane is her name, but she okay. incorporates recovery into her program. Um, and she's very clear about it. And you can see it. She's like, when you are from a flexibility perspective, when you are plateauing and not getting anywhere, you've worked too hard. Yes. You yes. need to rest. Yep, yep. I'm so, so glad that you're saying that. I think that guys do whatever it takes to make this, to make rest your thing, like recovery, name it recovery. So fascinating because we have so much 
charge around the word rest. And for years, because we most of us have been shamed for being <laughs> lazy if mm. we want to rest. When you talk about rest in our society, it is instantly associated with laziness and an unwillingness to work. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So and I, I mean, understand I why don't... most people resist rest. Right? I, yeah. I mean, we're on my rest day now. I don't see clients on this day in the week mm. because then I can't see as many clients in the rest of the week. Yes. I need a day off from from client work so that yeah. I can be ready for the rest of the week and I can give my clients my 100%. Yeah. With one-on-one -on -one coaching, I also have coach one week on and one week off because of that, because I can't hold space for people consistently. I mean, other coaches can do that, but I found that I cannot. Like I need one full week to rest and recover as you would, uh, as your uh, coach would say, or as you would say now, it's perfect. I love it because rest is actually recovery. But like, I guess we just have to rename it because of our um, dramas and growing up in a society that's like, well, how much can, because this is what I keep seeing, right? I see all these adverts on social media, like how to get more done in a day. And I'm like, what the hell? There's only so many hours in a day, but there's so much pressure for us to do more and get more done. It's actually, that is extremely scarring for the body. You know, it actually causes so much pain in the body. And we're not even realizing that we're just re-traumatizing ourselves. But yeah. hey. You know, because we are, I mean, very, very few people in this country statistically are employed and gainfully employed and livably employed. Yeah. Um, minimum wage is not the minimum, it's not the maximum that so many people get. Yeah. Uh, so it all makes sense, the, the struggle and the hustle and can't be lazy. But I think, you know, any and it's the shaming, right? It's the poverty shaming that goes with that. There is this yeah. incessant underlying shaming that people are poor because they are lazy. Whereas people are, whilst people are often poor because of systemic failures, right? It's, it's like poverty is not because of individual laziness. It's often because there is a systemic failure right so the way that the system is set up only benefits the few and not the many and however the way that the system keeps going and doesn't hold itself accountable is to literally shame the individual for not being able to fight entire systems and not be able to maneuver the system also if you are spending your life this is not these are not my words it's a meme that i'm butchering because i can't remember the words um but when you spend your life trying to live paycheck to paycheck, you cannot fulfill your potential. Yes, true. I really believe this, hey? I really do believe this. I do believe even with the work that I do that until a person, like this, so that the work can work to a point, right? But that a lot of, this is why we need to work a lot with the nervous system because actually, Poverty changes the mind. And that's this is why we need to do the body work. This is why over the years you have seen my work go from dealing with trauma and doing a lot of the meditations to now going so much deeper into the nervous system, understanding the nervous system and the body. So when people shame people for poverty, it's just because we don't want to, um, it's the way that the system has just impacted us and taught us to feel ashamed of our poverty and not to look too closely at the system. And then what we do, what I sometimes find is that we basically, we do this thing where we then celebrate those one or two people that make massive wealth. And then we say, oh my God, they are super special and so amazing. And we're looking, instead of asking the questions as to 
what is it, how can the system be improved? Or how can financial education also be improved? How can we support people holistically so that more people can get out of poverty or more people can make money, right? And start to improve their finances. I mean, if we look at the livable wage thing again, if, if companies just paid people properly, they're part of big companies. I'm not talking about any company in particular, but big companies that have the power to do so could impact poverty, but they don't. They rather to take would rather put profit above people. Um, yep, yep, yep. Because poverty has wow. been created for this system. If we have people who are desperate for work, treat them like shit, and tell them that they are lazy if they leave an abusive working relationship. Yes, yes. Which is also why I have so much. I mean, like everyone knows I have so much drama with the law of attraction stuff because I'm just like, actually, we're not looking at how we're not, it doesn't, it basically, I find that like the reason why we have latched on to things like positive thinking and visualization without ever talking about trauma where money is concerned is because the minute you can't talk about trauma without talking about systemic oppression and without talking about how like systems, uh, how systemic oppression aids in our trauma as a people. You can't talk about it without talking about patriarchy, right? And the trauma of patriarchy, we can't talk about it like without talking about the trauma of gender, of sexual identity, etc. because all these things aid to trauma and all these things impact the way that we see ourselves and how we show up in the world, which then impacts our finances. But if we're just saying, well, everything is happening because you're not thinking positively enough, well, then the fault is with the individual who is not able to think through systems of, of poverty or systems of oppression like racism and patriarchy, etc then it's your fault because you're not thinking positively enough and you're not able to hold the positive uh, mindset throughout all this insanity, right? And this is for me why I'm like, please can we not just limit uh, create a money and dealing with money to just this positive thinking and visualization, et cetera, because Honestly, it's hard to positive think when your body is in survival mode, when your entire nervous system is freaking out. Let's just, we can't downplay that. We can't downplay how like, if I am watching black bodies being shot in the media or I'm reading about other women being sexually violated, that as a woman and as a black person, I am not being impacted by that. And that it's not vicarious trauma that then changes the way that I feel in my body. Like, I'm not going to be like, oh, I feel safe enough to walk in the middle of the street anywhere in the world at midnight, you know? That is going to obviously change how I feel in this body, which is going to change how I show up even financially. Absolutely. I don't know why I'm holding onto yeah. the public health care at the moment, but I'm just thinking about how public health care is so not free because the cost of health and yeah. public health care is so huge. People have to take a day yes. take a day off work if they're lucky only one day, assuming they have work. Mm -hmm. um, the public health care system is so badly designed because I think it's working, it's not broken, it's fucked from design. Um, that yes. staff are overworked on purpose. Um, there's mm -hmm. full of hierarchies and abuse in the system and people who are subject to the public health system are then subject to uh, projected and perpetuated abuse. There's a word I'm looking for, it's not projected. Um, it's basically passed on. So the people in working in the hospitals yeah. and the clinics are abused by the system and they therefore pass on that abuse to their patients and treat people who are coming for services as if they are wasting time for coming for services. Yes, yes. Whew, wow, this is so awesome. Like, I love that, like, this is such an, so completely different to what I had in mind. 
podcast and you guys probably, if you're listening in, then you probably know what I mean. So just a few more questions for you, Casey, especially around money. Um, how did you feel emotionally about money before starting the Money Magic course? And what has shifted as you do the inner work in the course? And how have you started? Uh, and as you see these shifts, how has your definition of trauma around money started to get clearer? So I think, I think I've always been resentful of money. Um, mm. I grew up with money, but there was always a threat of no money. There was a constant threat. Um, mm. Can I go to the movies? Maybe this week. Um, and it was never intended that way, but that was how I put it together. Um, so I was quite resentful of people who had money that I did not have. Um, I think my family growing up fall into the, the middle class who spend more than they have. Um, so there was always the appearance of money more than the money, even though there was enough money to stay where we were. Yeah, that I think we all identify with that, right? That we grew up in families where it appears that we have more money than we actually have. Mm. Um, hmm. Which meant relationships at home when it came to money was always fraught. There was always, is this request for, I don't know, have you paid my school fees this month going to be met with a fight? Do I have to defend myself? Do I have to defend why you agreed to pay for my fees? Um, like all the things, all my postgraduate degrees were scholarships and bursaries um, because I could not handle the emotional pressure that my family didn't realize they were putting on me. So I'm very lucky that they managed to pay off my undergrad, extremely privileged that they were able to do that. Um, but the, the trauma that I felt from that was like, I'm gonna sort myself out. So both my postgraduate degrees were bursaries and I had to pay for them by working for the university. Um, yeah. But at least it was a, a defined agreement, you know, you put this many hours in, mark yep. this many papers, do this much tutoring, and yep. you get this much money. Yeah, there's nothing, I again, trauma can be something that subtle. And that is actually, I find that when it comes to money, that's actually one of the deepest traumas, the trauma of always having to explain as a child why you needed that money, the trauma of always having to think five times before you ask for money. And then you go into business and then you're like the business owner who doesn't know how to ask people who owe you money to pay you. And you don't understand why you're literally always like, <gasps> how do I ask for my own money or you don't know how to invoice and yet it's tied to these events and also the trauma of is there going to be money am I going to be able to do it so you're always like on this tenterhooks with money it's like I'm thinking of it as I'm thinking of this it's almost like a movie it's like is it going to happen are they going to go in the door are they not oh my gosh what's going to happen so it's the same thing except that it's your life and your entire nervous system so you're always like do I, do I not, who do I plan? And then you, we grow into these adults that are like that with money. Can I, can I not? We, we have a hard time making decisions around money. And then we're like, but why does it feel like I can't make a decision financially and stick to it? Well, because of this, we've never experienced like an actual decision and like trusting that it's going to happen. So this is how our nervous system works when it comes to money. And also to their to both sides, their to their benefit, but also to add to the story is the month mm -hmm. that stuff was paid. There was also no conversation about don't worry, it's sorted this month. You don't have to worry. I still had to find out. I still had to ask. Mm -hmm. I still had to prepare myself for the but you said conversation. Yep, right. Like you. Oh my gosh! As you're so this, I was well, starting to see how that worked for me. I would. I would, before I would, especially in relationships, in romantic relationships, before I would go into money conversations, I would like beef myself up, make myself angry, be prepared for war, you know, because this is how I entered money discussions as a child. It was like, I am prepared to fight for what I want. I need to fight to get what I want where money is concerned. So even with 
my significant other, I would like enter that space like that. And then with friendships, because I don't want, like, I'm not sure, like I'm scared. Oh my gosh, I don't want to upset my friends. I have no voice. I shut down. I have panic attacks. Ooh, wow. Okay. I'm laying this all down to your 12 year old. Everything you're sharing now is a very clear link to your 12 year old. I need to fight for boundaries. I need to literally yeah. have a wall for boundaries. And boundaries can be really soft and gentle when you believe you're allowed them. And that's how I am right now, right? Like I'll even smile to people if people are asking me for money. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I'll smile and say no, but what do you need it for? How else can I help you? You know, it's just such a different response. So completely different. Wow. Absolutely. Oh, loving this conversation. So what are some of your income and savings shifts that you've seen since starting the Money Magic course? So when I started the Money Magic course, I was very much living like my parents and my family. So I had the appearance of a successful business. Um, mm. With the internal turmoil of, do I have enough clients? Can I cover my basic rent? Can I, like, before I even talk to my salary, can I do this? Can I do that? Um, mm -hmm. Currently, I mean, I had a conversation with Level, I think 2018, and I said, I live a middle class life on a working class income. Uh, like, I think we can all resonate with that, right? Like, you just spoke to so many of us. <laughs> Because um, I have so much privilege, like there is so much privilege. My spouse, even before we were married, has been supporting me um, yeah. more than just financially. So yeah. there's been so many layers of support. I am in no way an island. Um, mm. I'm very well supported by a, yeah. a network of support, including my family, but yeah. not financially from them because they need to deal with their stuff too. Um, yeah. But there's so many layers of it. So I was able to live that life because someone was paying for this and someone was paying for that. And I just had to pay for my petrol. And for a long time, I didn't even have to pay for my petrol. That was covered by someone else. So like there was always, I didn't realize it, but I was, money was always there for me. It just wasn't in a way that I could call it mine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because my income did not match my life. Yeah, and I'm sure there must have been fear around that because I lived that life with one of my exes where he was paying for absolutely everything. I mean, even the toiletries. I was using toothpaste because I couldn't afford to. And I I was always so anxious because my, my thought was like, what happens when this relationship ends? Or what happens if something happens to him? Because you're always so aware that like your money story is so tenuous, right? It's reliant on these other people. I mean, something you've just reminded me that I didn't even think to mention in the beginning was from the age of 18, I was a professional dancer and I was dancing. Oh. So I stopped dancing. I danced for about five years professionally, dance and taught. Uh, I taught dancing too. Wow, and what kind of dancing? I was a belly dancer. Oh, that explains a lot. <laughs> with Because um, I've seen you do belly dancing videos and also I've uh, seen uh, your pole dancing videos. It's beautiful. Yes, I can't yeah. say go belly dancer. She is on stage with me whenever I'm on stage. Because um, I was belly dancing <laughs> for 12 years. So I was probably oh, wow. more than that because I think I... I was dancing for five years before I started professionally because I started very young, it was like 15, mm -hmm. less than 15. I, don't, I can't math right now. Um, wow. But so I was, all my money that I earned belly dancing was going towards my toiletries and my vitamins. Mm -hmm. So my, my immediate necessities that weren't covered by other people, that's what my belly dancing paid for. Wow. And now what has the shift been like? The shift is, I mean, belly dancing is hard work. You have to yeah. go out, you dance at night, your shift starts at 9 p.m. I am an early morning person. So yeah. the conversation has to be amazing for me to be awake past half past nine. Um, <laughs> but in order to survive, I was, you know, traveling to Pretoria, and driving all these long distances for little bits of money. So like no ease, mm -hmm. lots of struggle. 
the idea mm. of that kind of lifestyle is just so distant from me now. I work, I mean, I work until seven, but that's my choice. Um, yes. Because I start work at 11. So nice. I, I start at 11 in the morning. I end at seven. I see my clients in that time. I have time for lunch. I have breaks in between to play with the dog because it's necessary um, for both of us. Um, mm. I now pay a fair share of the home stuff. I can I contribute. I pay for my own insurance. Oh. I pay for my own car. Um, I even bought a new car that has aircon. Wow! Um, <laughs> just I, love home, it. I didn't need it, <laughs> but I love it when I use it. So like yeah. all these, things, like I now have a salary that I pay myself, but I have a separate account. So the business pays for all the business expenses, all my trainings. I'm currently saving up for a training in Budapest next year, hopefully. Um, like, which is very exciting because it's one of the international standards sexuality education, sexuality therapy uh, trainings. It's the world. Oh, wow, Casey, that's so, amazing. Thank you. Saving up for that, but that's the business expense. It's not my expense. So yeah. my salary is my money. Um, yeah. So like just being able to separate and have it and like, I think I even paid for your course through the business because it was a business expense. Mm -hmm. Like, wow, I've seen, like, I remember when we first started and you, uh, you said to me when I brought out the retreat in Thailand, you were like, I really want to do this retreat, but I just don't know how do I justify going somewhere, traveling somewhere to do something and spending that kind of money. And here you are, you're like, I'm going to Budapest for a training. That is what I do now. That's my life. <laughs> I mean, we need to also take into consideration. I don't know why I'm defending this, but I'm saving now for November next year. And so oh, wow. Still, I love it. I love it because I know how far you have come with this right because a huge part of this was that oh my gosh how do i get to do this stuff you know how would i why how do i do this and still justify it to myself and now you're doing it and that's i think one yeah. of the most powerful things it's like this is how we know that we shifted something because we can now step into this next ver level version of who we never ever imagined ourselves to be. I think that as we expand financially, certain things are like unjustifiable. Like there's no way I could do this. This doesn't make sense. This is too much. And then as we start to heal, it starts to feel more and more comfortable to spend money on certain things. But more than anything, it starts to feel more and more comfortable to spend money on things for ourselves, not for other people. Because where most people will start is they'll be like, oh, so-and-so needs this, we can buy it, but then we don't know how to give to ourselves, right? Because often giving to ourselves is also about like what we have been taught about who we are, what we deserve, what we are worthy of, et cetera, et cetera. And I like to kind of disconnect the worthiness and all that and just like work on the trauma around the messaging of self, right? I don't, I feel like as children as we're in, are like, absorbing these messages no child is using messages like I don't feel worthy I don't feel deserving so we have to work with the actual events around the trauma so most of us don't shift because we're using these loft this lofty language it's hard to integrate the trauma and really connect with it because we're using adult language for things that happen to children whereas it's not the child that is using that language and we need to get into the language of the child to actually heal that so that's something that I learned because I'm like okay the adult me is the one that's not feeling worthy but as a child you're just like oh my god that means I'm not lovable they don't like me when I do this or that kind of stuff so that's painful language and I think that's also why we prefer the lofty language because the easier. that is really really painful I mean you know it's much easier to say oh, I can't even think of a toxic positivity thing I, I identify them but I can't bring them out of my mouth um but it's much <laughs> easier to say this sucks doesn't it we don't know we hope it's going to get better statistically mm. it's going to get better 
But right now it sucks. Yes, yes, yes. I agree. So my second last question to you is, what are the three lessons in the course that you have found particularly helpful or that just like created this shift for you? If there's any three or anything, maybe I did a live class or I said something. Um, <laughs> anything. I'm, just, I, I'm, I'm not a consistent listener anymore. Um, Thank God. <laughs> maybe. I feel like you have oh my God, Casey, can I just say this? When you started, you would be like, I want to go from lesson zero and do them in the proper order. And I was like, why? Like, even I don't do the course in like lesson zero, lesson one, lesson two, lesson three. And yeah, like the courses and lessons, just so that it makes sense for people, but it's not meant to be done in like uh, actual, I don't know, like, manner where you go from one in a linear fashion <laughs> i mean i really so have the ones that i've done which have you liked <laughs> i needed to tell you this i went for coffee um with zanele uh i want to say in Corsi, but i could mm. be wrong because she also bought the course at the same time as me and we were busy talking about how hard it is to do the course in the order you've set it up for us <laughs> and <only laughs> after i think i complained a few times in the group and you had to actively give me permission more than once to jump around. Um, yeah, I was like, I say this don't try to do this course in a linear fashion and don't try to do that, like do it in, cause guys, so in the course, I also, I think I, I was also like, oh, let me help people along. I was like, do this lesson for two days, do this for three days. I was just like, ignore all that, forget it. Just jump around and go wherever you want. Because <laughs> that's how the course has been created. Like the lessons also move around. One day lesson seven will be this. And then I'm like, oh no, that should actually move to here. This is talking about this. So everything changes constantly. And if you are married to doing the course in a linear fashion, I'm also going to disturb you. Right? Like, it's going to just ruin your life to be in this course and it try to so do difficult. It was so difficult. Um, <laughs> I think the, 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 the live courses that I managed to listen to, although I listen to replays more than I do lives, um, mm. anything around the vow and visibility um, oh. stands up. Even saying yes to you, like touched on my vow of invisibility. Um, mm. So there was stuff. I mean, and because of my course, I have been on podcasts at least one week, one recording a week for months now. Um, wow. I had to pause when I had COVID because <laughs> I didn't realize I did a couple while I was sick with COVID. I just thought I had flu. <laughs> so oh I put through because <laughs> podcasts are fun, but it's also where I do my volunteering. I consider this my volunteer work because work mm -hmm. happens regardless of it. Mm -hmm. um, so any media type work is, is the work I do for volunteering, mm -hmm. if that makes sense, in addition mm -hmm. to other stuff that I volunteer with. So anything sense. around visibility, um, yeah. so much around that. Anything around forgiving our parents has been really meaningful. I mean, I can't tell you what lesson numbers they are. Um, yeah. I remember there was one meditation I did I don't know if it was an inner child, but a particular memory came up around my parents. Mm. And I mean, they, they did their best. They do their best. But I mm. need a different. Um, and being able to reconcile the two and being able to recognize their best. Um, yeah. That yeah. I don't have so much resentment yeah. about the discrepancy. Yeah. So I think mm. that's the mother and father wounds, right? And... I think what I love about these le these meditations is that nowhere in the money magic course do I say, <laughs> forgive your parents, forgive them. Like I'm like, give yourself permission to be as angry and as pissed off and as anything. But I think because so many of us have been forced onto this forgiveness trend again, like, ooh, forgive them. It has made it hard for us to truly feel the emotions that we feel, right? And then just doing the work where we get to process the anger, get to integrate it, get to honor it. The forgiveness comes. Who mm -hmm. I promise you, I never ever thought I would get to the point where I forgive my mother's family, ever. My maternal family, 
I, cause I mean, it's not just the boundaries around a body agency. It's just families. We all know guys, it's just layers upon layers where you're just like, by the time you're an adult, you're just like, I'm over these people. <laughs> you know? So mm -hmm. just the feeling that and honoring that is so important. I also want to say that I'm scared of your mother and father wound modules. <laughs> so I haven't done them yet. So this, these memories came up in probably in a teen and a child ones. Ah, uh, yeah, um, probably. Because yeah. I'm, I'm not yet ready to face my, move, my wounds. I, one day. Oh my gosh, yeah, no, I know that. And it's funny because you and I were talking about how offline, how South Africa is that kind of country where we notice that many people shy away from doing this deep trauma work because they don't want to have to feel things because we're so scared of feeling all the various traumas. And I so understand and I so resonate. And yeah, I think I just had to do the work because my stuff was on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> so um, my last question is, um, people often feel like they get a lot just from my free stuff, which I do believe people do get a lot from that. Like a lot of students have told me to stop saying that people don't get stuff from that because they say they shifted a lot just by listening to the live videos, etc. What do you think has was the difference from uh, just uh, what is the difference from just listening to me doing the live stuff and then actually going in to do the inner work and being in the course? There's an experiential level that even if you just do one meditation and get frustrated and try it again because you've got to go from one to two to three, um, <laughs> there's something about it that is just different. I think also being part of the student group, the, the student group, even though I won't touch my course for months on end, I learn constantly because there's notifications that come up whenever you post in the group, whether it's a comment or a post. Um, yeah. And that's part of the paid work. We paid for that. It's part of the paid group. Um, I'm such a strong believer in the community element, which is why my workshops that are live, I, I believe people will benefit more than they could from just the content. Um, yeah because it's the interactions, it's the sharing of stories, it's the sharing of healing. This is how I've navigated it. This is how it didn't blow up in my face. This is how yeah. it did. Um, yeah. I think it's the stories that we just, that we, that we get access to by being a paid student, in addition to actually getting to do the work and having these weird ass meditations where suddenly my whole left leg feels like ice and I have to figure out what texture ice is. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah they are weird meditations guys I'm not gonna lie they they are a little trippy I feel it feels a little trippy recording them so I can't like even doing them for me is a little trippy but well, I mean okay. the first time I used to listen to your meditations to go to sleep because I was struggling to sleep and your voice really really relaxed <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, full disclosure, I sometimes do that as well. I like put on a meditation and I'm like, my mind will probably like hit a block and will instead of wanting to diagnose anything that's coming up or analyze whatever's coming up, we'll just be like, F this, let's put her to sleep. So I sometimes use the meditations to sleep as well. <laughs> wow. Whew. Casey, I think I speak to all our listeners when I say you have shared so much with us. You have been so generous. And I also think I speak for everyone when I say, please tell us, how do we get to your course? How do we sign up for your course? And how do we um, get to work with you? How do people get to reach out to you? Cool. So I've got two websites. Um, yes. I've got my counseling website, which is whatnowcounseling.co.za. Counseling spelled C-O-U-N-S-E-L-L-I-N-G because there are many ways to spell counseling and that's the only one that will access me um, <laughs> by email at least. So that's all the information about the counseling services. I currently do have a waiting list of about three months. So if you wow. want to get hold of me, you have to get on the list to get to see me in three months. Yes. Um, so, so there's that. 
And then the courses, the web website is tools for having the talks, plural.co.za. So talks with an S. Um, on there, you can get access to the workshops, information about the workshops, and the online course. There's a banner that'll take you to the site that I'm currently selling it on. Awesome. Um, Thank you. And so social much. media matches. So there's there's Instagram. And social media, how where are you on Instagram? Instagram tools for having the talks. I'm not very active unless you ask me questions and I will answer them in a live. Same thing okay. for Facebook. I sometimes share content through the Facebook because my age will tell you I'm more of a Facebooker than an Instagrammer. Um, <sighs> uh, there's a What Now counseling page where I sometimes share helpful stuff just around mental health. Um, and yeah, that's where we are at the moment. And there's a body positive parenting with Casey Blake if you want to group space just to talk about how hard and frustrating being a body positive parent is in a sex negative world. Mm. Wow. Casey, thank you. Thank you for A, bringing up our socioeconomic issues on this podcast. Like we haven't done quite a bit of that, right? But like it's hard to not um i feel like socioeconomic issues are directly tied to trauma because often trauma is the result of systemic failure and socioeconomic issues and also just for sharing such much needed information on just sex and just um setting boundaries and honoring our bodies I know so many people got value from this. And guys, please do reach out to Casey. I know so many people who have little kids who want to have uh, talks with kids and just want to have a different kids, especially I feel like both girls and boys. I was going to say especially girl children. I'm like, oh, hell no. Even little boys, right? So that by the time kids are in their teens and they in their, uh, they um, adults and like in their early 20s, they already know how to maneuver intimate spaces. They don't have to go through the dramas that we went through. And this, I know Casey talks a lot about this, that you keep having these conversations, not once off, but often as they grow up. So this is why I really want to encourage you guys to sign up for the courses with Casey, right? Reach out to Casey. This is how we change trauma, especially sexual trauma, because gosh, that's another kettle of fish right so thank you so much thank you Money so magicians. much Jen. oh thank you casey and thank you money magicians if you're listening to this you're loving the shifts that casey had in terms of her money journey and what she shared and also you've listened to other other episodes that other students have a way other students have shared their journeys and you've listened to the incredible shifts around money and you want to be part of the money magic course then go to wealthy-money.com forward slash money magic again wealthy-money.com forward slash money magic sign up for the money magic course or get on the waiting list if the course isn't open for registration and with that, I will see you guys next week with another incredible episode around trauma and money. Cheerio!